that maybe that maybe hadn't had the opportunity to introduce themselves yesterday, to say hello and to show us their faces. So I see that we have Federico, which is our colleague here in the CLV. So Federico, could you please introduce yourself to everybody? Uh, hi, I'm Federico from the Secretariat. I'm the Accessibility Policy Officer here and always as a big fan of learning and looking forward to learning more about this, uh, this session and uh, interacting with you, the colleagues. Thank you, Federico. So I think we have also Pedro Lassie. I, sorry if I mispronounced your name, Romanam. So if you want to say some words and introduce yourself, please. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, it's Pedro Lais from Manam. I'm here with my colleague, Abel Manique. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, and we do have other two new participants today. Uh, Bula uh, Benson. Hello, I'm here. Hello, could, could you yeah, turn your uh, camera on so we can see you and tell us who you are and where you come from? Uh, my name is Andrew Spediako, um, administrator at NALAC, National Association of Local Authorities of Ghana. Uh, okay. It's unfortunate yesterday I couldn't join. Um, I had some challenges uh, with my network because I traveled outside Accra and uh, um, I hope to uh have a wonderful discussion this morning thank you okay andrew welcome welcome to the session and we're going to do a brief recap so you're for sure going to get some of the information and the insights of yesterday's session so we have a final person that is called bula benson are you here bula benson so I think the person is not here. So with this, I just welcome you and, and thank you for coming for the second day. And I will give the floor to, oh, Josephine, you want to say you didn't introduce yourself yesterday. So please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Josephine Kapinga, the Information and Advocacy Officer from the Local Government Association of Zambia. So yesterday I did not introduce myself. I had some challenges with my speaker and also the camera. But yeah, looking forward to learning much more. Thank you, Thank Josephine. You. And it's very good that you got to solve those problems because we really wanted to see your face with your camera on. So now, now that we, we all introduce ourselves, I, I pass the floor to our, our colleague, Charles Petsika, who will be the moderator for the day. So Charles. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Uh, welcome everybody again. We are into our second day today, um, and uh, we are moving along in a way which is uh, a progression. And hopefully by the end of the four days, we will have our decentralized cooperation fully, fully into our systems. Now, first of all, today, I just want to have a very quick recap of um, what we covered yesterday. I would look at the yesterday as the foundational day in our learning. It is the day when we were setting the, setting the, uh, the base for, for our, our, our learning. The purpose of yesterday was really to ground the meaning of decentralized cooperation, first of all, and uh, fully try to fully understand what the implications were. So on day one, we explored the meaning of decentralization, this decentralized cooperation. What do we mean when we talk about decentralized cooperation? We gave a definition, an explanation of um, the concept. Um, second, second slide, please. Can I, the next slide, please. Right, we then explored uh, very quickly the, the progression of decentralized cooperation over time. When, how it started and how it has progressed and what we have today is uh, decentralized cooperation. You recall that uh, we, we talked about uh, the 
the aftermath of the Second World War, when it was really North-North uh, cooperation. We then talked about uh, the colonial era and the end of the colonial era, which sparked uh, North-South cooperation, where in most cases, the, con 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 the former colonial governments were trying to establish good relations with their Southern partners. And we had uh, quite a lot of uh, North-South uh, North -South, uh, cooperation. We then moved on to understand that uh, the South can learn from each other. So we, we saw the development of South-South cooperation and uh, also these cooperations became linked up to Northern partners in what we call uh, triangular cooperation. And uh, finally, we, we saw that now, we now have a cooperation at a network level where we have global coalitions of networks like the U UCLG, uh, the UCLG Africa, and uh, quite a number of other networks. We also, we also indicated the progression from purely political ties between institutions becoming more increasingly more and more um, in bringing in technical cooperation as well, which means there was more knowledge sharing, um, experience sharing in terms of how to improve the, the development agenda. So this is, this is the history. Next slide, please. We also linked up yesterday the relationship uh, between uh, the decentralized cooperation and, uh, and uh, the African Union Agenda 2063. We know, all know that uh, this is preceded uh, by a few months, the launching of the SDGs themselves. Um, but uh, what uh, the Africa Agenda 2063 um, propounded were very key aspirations, which we will not again go through. We went through them yesterday, but uh, you can see them on the screen there. Um, and we, we believe that uh, almost all of them, all of them are incorporated into the new uh, 2030 agenda, the SDGs. Next slide, please. We also talked about the African Charter on the values and principles of decentralization, local governance and local development. This is a key instrument that uh, the African Union developed to promote the establishment of local governments in, in Africa. And uh, we highlighted it because uh, it is one key instrument for Africa, which truly, truly supports decentralization on the continent. Next slide, please. We then had an uh, analogy which was explained for me, it started off as a complex thing, but now I quite understand it very well, the analogy of the, of the bicycle, the various parts of the bicycle, how they are related to our agenda here in terms of uh, this decentralized cooperation. It, this was explained, but I want to hasten to say that uh, if any did not understand this uh, explanation yesterday, please uh, raise it during the meeting, during this uh, seminar, so that uh, a further explanation can be given. You'll find that this analogy is quite useful in understanding the various parts of uh, decentralized cooperation and their relationship to the, to the sustainable development goals. Next slide, please. We then again look at, at, the, at a global perspective to try and map out the, how the development agenda has been uh, progressing from the Busan uh, partnership, Addis Ababa action agenda, which was very key in that uh, it really strengthened, it really strengthened uh, the, the local government finance element um, and acknowledged that there was need to support uh, local governments uh, financially. We looked at the global climate agreement, the Paris agreement, uh, again, a very important benchmark in the, in the progression in, in, uh, on the development agenda. We looked at the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, 
And I think uh, one of the one of the key key developments was the new urban agenda. This new urban agenda is a very very strong um, uh, policy document to support um, decentralization. So and also it acknowledges that the way our urban areas are developing requires a new look. And decentralized cooperation is one such important uh, new look. Then finally, of course, the, on the development agenda, we then had the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable um, Development, the SDGs as we, as we know them now. Next slide, please. Then we had a quick look at uh, the trying to build a common narrative between decentralized cooperation and the SDGs. Where are the relationships? Uh, what are, where are the similarities? We, 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 we looked at uh, the contribution of SDGs to decentralized cooperation and the trans transformative nature of decentralized cooperation in line and for the SDGs. And we also looked at uh, decentralized cooperation as a driver of the SDG localization. As you know, um, well, most people in local government now realize that uh, it is key to localize the SDGs. Otherwise, without them being localized, they will fail. Everybody, almost everybody in the development world knows that uh, this is the case. So it is important to localize the SDGs and in this uh, process, it is also important to, to, to promote partnerships between local governments on, um, to, so that we ensure that uh, the local, local governments can share experiences, can learn together to, to improve on their development agenda. Uh, next slide, please. Right, finally, we then looked at uh, the, the whole structure of the, of the SDGs and uh, decentralized cooperation. And we explained the different chapters, the different chapters of the, of the, um, of the learning module four. It has six chapters and uh, we explained what each chapter um, deals with and uh, also what uh, elements of the SDGs, each chapter is, will, will, will uh, endeavor to, to, to address. Next slide, please. I hope that uh, I've given you a good overview of uh, what we did yesterday. Um, then today, our focus, we are now moving more into practice. Our day two will now look at decentralized cooperation and SDGs and start implementing, start looking at how best we can implement what we are trying to promote in practice. So this is the focus of day two. And also we will look at how we can design decentralized cooperation in line with the sustainable development goals. So here we are, we are ready to go and uh, we should have a start now. Thank you, thank you very much. We, we now move on. Um, so our first session today is, um, we will be led by Maria and um, we begin to unpack decentralized, de decentralized cooperation typologies and the modalities. So Maria, I hand over to you now. Yeah, thank you, Charles, and thank you for for bringing every uh, all the content that we that we covered yesterday. Uh, I think it's very informative and just put us in the in the feeling and in the rhythm to to go and 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 learn more. So so for this, uh, just to let you know that we are entering the third session, which corresponds uh, to the third uh, chapter of the guide that you have. Uh, and as a reminder, uh, please be aware that the, the, this, this guide that we developed is, is your guide 
to do this. It's not just this presentation, it's not just this, mm, this training of training, but all the information and further information, if you want to deep on what you want to do, uh, is in the guide. So, so for this part, uh, we have uh, chapter three, uh, session three, that talks about how does DC, how, has, how does the centralized cooperation work in practice? Uh, the aim of this, of this, of this, um, maybe a little bit further, I, I think, a little bit more. It's okay. So anyway, the 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 um, the aim of this session is to have an understanding, a bigger understanding on different typologies, different modalities, different flows and forms of disease. We also gonna be seeing some uh, very good international experiences here in this section, and 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 is and and I'm, I'm pretty sure you're gonna be enjoying this part. As part of this of, of this uh, session, there is this part of the analogy that we did with the bicycle, right? Do you remember that every single part of, of our module is related with one specific part on, on, on the bicycle? And for this part, we have the, um, the gears, the gear assembly, which actually represents, of course, the, the different, the, the module part. So that's why we we want to define as the as these typologies, modalities, and flows. But one of the, on the other thing that is very important for you to take into account is that uh, DC has different ways of, of developing itself. But it also uh, DC includes um, this learning comes from different parts. So it's just not north and south, but uh, it can be south south. It can be tri triangular. So we're gonna see that that learning and experiences come in all directions. So that is that is one of the most important things of our of our session today on on the session three. So I'm just gonna finish here with the setting the scene. Um, back to you, Charles, to give the floor to our next presenter. Thank you, thank you, Maria. So Nolu Tanto, we get our first presentation from uh, Nolu Tanto. Are you with us? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Yes, and my audible. Can yes. you hear me? Okay. Thank you very much, Charles and Marielle. I'm very delighted to be here today. Greetings, everyone, from sunny Durban, South Africa. Uh, so the table that we can see on our screen, it's lifted from, from the 2017 platformer study. And it basically summarizes the type of cooperation modalities, flows, and methodologies. And before we move any further, I'd like to encourage our practitioners on the ground. Um, if you haven't encountered um, these terminologies before, your cooperations and your modalities and your methodologies, etc., to not be overwhelmed. This is a learning process at the end of the day, and we're all here to learn. And we'll just take it by step by step, and we can just have an open mind and, and, and have an open approach to it. Okay, so then as, as a point of departure, it's helpful to note that over time, the nature of decentralized cooperation has changed. And previously, it was known as the transfer of aid from the north to the south, and it was known as vertical partnerships. And today it involves a complex variety of horizontal partnerships reflected in Agenda 2030's principle of universality. Now, today, in today's co context, you'd find that more recognition is given to partners in the less capacitated context and, and limited resources. So today, I will be covering the, the types of of, of cooperation, namely your direct cooperation, your indirect and delegated cooperation, as well as development, education, and awareness raising, together with the related modalities. Insofar as the flows and methodologies are involved, I will leave it, um, it to be addressed a bit later. Can we go to the next slide, please? So 
when we look at direct cooperation, so direct cooperation is partners is the partnership between the local and regional governments, wherein the resources, expertise, knowledge, experience, all of these factors, they flow in between the different territories in multiple directions between the multiple actors. Originally, it was known as North to South Vertical Partnerships, as I alluded to before, and today they flow in the multiple directions. And different modalities of direct cooperation can be identified, and the most commonly used by local and regional governments are vertical, territorial, local government agencies or international cooperation, as well as the network. So I'd like to focus on these four. Um, I'd like to spend some time focusing on these. When we refer to vertical modality, this modality is largely centered on the bilateral and multilateral relations. And it's traditionally based on the rich North and poor South narrative of, of, of a transfer. So it's been a move towards the more horizontal approaches owing to their higher levels of, of, of ownership. And then territorial partnership, it refers to the creation of structured bilateral and multilateral horizontal relationships between the, the local and regional governments. It also reflects the Buzon principles and fosters exchange of knowledge, expertise, and shared innovation. And it's also focused on, on reinforcing the, the local strategies. So we, when we have a look at the local government agencies for international cooperation, this modality it strengthens operational capacity through peer-to-peer -peer learning. So it ensures uh, more effective public policies and fosters innovation based on local knowledge. And last but not least, we will cover the, the network mod modality. This modality, it emerged as a way to support decentralized cooperation. And this, 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 this modality, it, it provides training exchanges as well as advocacy to create an enabling environment to local and regional governments. Next slide, please. So now we had indirect cooperation. So indirect cooperation, it involves local and regional governments encouraging the actions and development cooperation for other actors. It's, it's largely structured around the geographical, ge geographical and thematic priorities. So it also involves uh, your co financing scheme. As for this modality, the local and regional governments provide support to the local, to the local uh, NGOs through calls for proposals, for, for instance. And, and its key characteristic lies in its local associative fabric represented by NGOs and is committed and mobilized and strengthened contributing to the development and greater social cohesion at the local level. And of course, some of the local and regional governments, especially the larger cities and federal countries also use what is called delegated cooperation. So you might be asking yourself, what is delegated cooperation? So it means that bilateral uh, agreements are managed by third actors or with organizations or agencies such as the United Nations. Next slide, please. So we are referring to, on this slide, we are referring to development, education, and awareness raising. And here, the decentralized corporations, aims and funds are used by these very initiatives. And this focuses on, on encouraging local citizenship uh, in the global arena and, and promoting the sustainable development goals, your peace, uh, and your human rights. This can be fostered by the local and regional governments 
or the NGOs that specialize in uh, the decentralized corporation. And it's very important to note that decentralized corporation here is an umbrella for, for the scholarship programs that finance the visits uh, of students and academics from, from partner countries. So I would like to leave it here and I'm handing over to, to Sarah to facilitate the next session of questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nolutando, and um, for this very informative lecture. Uh, I think um, first maybe um, here you can see if cooperation is written, documented, made knowledgeable, it can account to this kind of analysis and this kind of conclusions uh, that Nolotando just uh, did. So maybe that is one uh, part I would like to raise your awareness because there are many, many practices in Africa, in particular also for direct cooperation between cities and long-standing relations. And often they are not documented and so they cannot be included in all this reflection and the new terminology, the new methodology where we UCLG um, are really um, a, a stakeholder and platformer in particular. So we all have a say and as more uh, stories we know, as more uh, reflection we have around the impact of these three modalities, as better we can also transmit to large donors like the European Commission uh, that a lot is going on and that sometimes the impact is not really related um, to the time of a project or to the funding of the project. So I would like now here to maybe uh, open the floor to those who are, I think most of you have, a, have an idea of cooperation. Later we will also see an example of a South-South Triangular uh, cooperation uh, in Mozambique. But first, maybe um, you in your own experience, uh, could you maybe give us uh, an idea or, or uh, what are you doing? Do you have uh, more direct cooperation, more indirect cooperation? How do you deal with agencies that implement projects? So how is this received? in the municipalities, no? Nolotando explained that, that if agencies, uh, for example, implement projects, this is what we call indirect cooperation. Uh, of course, you have a very efficient um, project management from a donor perspective, but what happens with the municipalities and are they really then also engaged or they just fund a project and that's it. So please, um, I would like to see hands raising and to give us a little bit of examples from your experiences. I haven't seen any hands, so <laughs> I will fish in the pool and I will ask Malawi. I think we have here several um, colleagues from Malawi. We also have the mayor who will later show his case um, do you want to make a point on this? Uh, we have the three modalities, indirect cooperation, direct cooperation, and also the, um, the learning approach. So this is to support individuals to uh, raise their knowledge. And this is also a development uh, approach. So- Paolo has his hand up, please. Okay, go ahead. Wonderful. So, floor is yours. You're muted, so maybe you can turn your mic on. Orvalo? Orvalo is uh, muted. Can you um, unmute your microphone, Oluwalu? Unmute. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
mute i've already had mute yes now you are, now you can speak we can hear you now okay thank you very much uh, mr Luwalo, municipal manager migori municipality from kenya migori municipality is in migori county one of the 12 units in kenya the question um, i just wanted to comment on the one of the issues that uh, you have talked about recently actually your team the the united cities local government actually brought an issue about the city marcos called city management and city management is a unique course it has never been in kenya in kenya we only have a local government and a regional urban development but this course actually to us we saw it as a, a step forward in achieving the sdg or uh, the localizing the, the centralized corporation because actually it will actually raise awareness about the city management because municipalities are evolving with a new constitutional dispensation. Because initially we have local governments, but now we have municipalities that are new. In fact, most municipalities are just one year old in Kenya and we request the development partners to come up so that we develop municipalities. Municipalities are the economic engine of development in towns. Because initially when the counties came, the counties only concentrated in the rural areas of Kenya, but they never gave a hand in urban areas. And now the, the World Bank, the international partners came in with the Kenya Urban Support Program and actually they dangled the carrots and the Kenyans, the, the governors or the devolution or the devolved unit accepted to create municipalities which are now well-founded with the management administration. We have the managers and the board in part. That's what I wanted to comment so that you continue and uh, we learn more. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that is very interesting. And it shows also maybe a, a challenge, no? To, to these, if, if we now look at your question or your suggestion, which is mainly yes, yes. build capacity to yes. manage cities successfully and builds the capacity of local governments, no? So this yes, has yes. A lot to do with the way how local government stuff is prepared because it's seen yes. probably as a whole, just public officer and not maybe the territorial management, which is like the way forward to, to uh, and also what is in the, the term city. Of course, um, if we look of, on this now in decentralized cooperation, uh, the indirect, the direct, or the educational, I think, of course, a third part is one, no? So, um, and I think we have here, for example, in Blantyre later, an example of training of particular um, persons, no? So as a training of city managers, of course, if we train all the city managers, then what we can do is create a network of practitioners that later helps each other it probably an effective investment in decentralized cooperation. But we also could imagine a city like partnering and coaching uh, another, no? So you have in Kenya some lead cities where you have people who are more um, advanced or want to run more or take more risk or are more committed. And this support through um, direct cooperation with other cities so that the inspiration of management is a, a, to a, a, a direct city to city insight. No? So that, of course, is another modality uh, for you, the challenges you have. Um, and the agency modality, probably they would say, OK, a UN agency is coming and then we make a course and, and we, we help and we make a project uh, with the cities. So, the, I think you have mentioned a very important demand and the three lines of cooperation could be effective uh, to support this. Yeah, and maybe later in the design parts, when we come to the next chapters, we can address this and, you, and we can keep your question in mind. Um, maybe Thierry, you are in the knowledge management of UCLG Africa. Um, could you maybe make a point, for example, on the practices of decentralized cooperation? Yesterday we learned um, an example. Um, Abi was was uh, giving us on between the Moroccan and the uh, Senegalese cities, 
how do you document it? So how can we uh, increase this chapter of wealth decentralized cooperation is giving us? Mm. Morning, Sarah. Morning, everyone. Um, I can actually we. Ah, it's my my video. Okay. Actually, uh, I can share more because we are in the process to build a knowledge base on decentralized cooperation. Uh, we need we want to, to to systematize and know more about the different aspects uh, about uh, decentralized co cooperation. Uh, we have um, some a lot of documents, but we need to organize them to know better how uh, the, 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 the things are done in the, in the field. Uh, we are in the process to build the, the, the data knowledge base and we will share with, uh, with you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Thierry. This also connects us eh, to your further work. Um, Genevieve and then Nayat. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, I think that as you take many, um, wind um, di direct cooperation. I think that Mal, the Municipal Institute of Learning, which I'll speak about a bit later, um, was set up for that purpose. Um, so we have direct cooperation with South to South. Um, and um, we are knowledge management hub. Um, I see a lot of the names. We've worked with Malawi, we've worked with Namibia, um, we've uh, worked in Botswana. Um, and that's what we do. We, we, we go around um, facilitating uh, knowledge about creating knowledge, sharing knowledge and storing knowledge. Um, and so we work, um, so it's about di direct cooperation with the territory. Excellent. And I think the impact of this direct cooperation is this long standing relations you have no, with all or with many participants here actually, but also with all your partners. Very good point. Nayat. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, to complete uh, what uh, Thierry said right now is uh, uh, within this new uh, structure and organization of UCLG Africa, we will uh, build, uh, let's say, um, a service offer to our members and network on dedicated to decentralized cooperation. And uh, this year, among this training of trainers, we will uh, organize the first forum of the territorial managers in charge of decentralized cooperation. The objective is to build the network of these managers at, uh, in our um, uh, ecosystem so that we will have uh, like focal points in uh, each national association and uh, we hope members uh, so that we can gather data, we can uh, empower our members, we can share good practices, and so on. So this is, is among our uh, vision for uh, how to promote and encore uh, a sustainable decentralized cooperation in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nayat. I think um, this concludes uh, this part of the typologies. We will later go deeper looking at the practices. Maybe I would uh, close with an example of my home country, Germany, that is in the moment the largest uh, funder of decentralized cooperation. And I was wondering why I never see the German cities running around. But then, of course, I uh, they, they run a lot around. But then I looked uh, in the detail and I saw that there is immense investment in education. And um, I, for example, I personally was not aware that this educational exchange counts on decentralized cooperation as decentralized cooperation with a huge volume of funding, just because uh, the education, university education also is uh, funded by the regions. So um, I think it is important to to uh, uh, cluster uh, the corporations we have, because only in this way, we also can do proper and precise advocacy, uh, what we need and what we want. And if, if a city sees for, um, what is the value of these different typologies. So um, thank you very much for the insights. And I would give then uh, now the floor to the next 
speakers, which is Fernando and Pedro, who will talk about the South South. Or Great, Sara. Great, Sara. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to always talk about this. I, this is a subject that I'm I am passionate about it and, and been working with for a long time. Uh, but uh, I, will, I will give the, the, the floor to Pedro and Abel after to give the great example of uh, the Association of uh, Mozambican Municipalities. But just comment a little bit on, on this process, right? Before, uh, as we can see on the, the presentations, of Najad yesterday, Charles yesterday and today, Nolotando and Sara um, and, and everyone commenting here, we, we can observe that the SDGs come in a certain way to demolish and this process that, that, that leads to the SDGs, they come to, to demolish the, the traditional ways of the traditional ways of doing uh, North-South cooperation based only in financial uh, resources, right? So it demolished because uh, the SDGs present the, the possibilities of basing uh, multi-stakeholders and more horizontal partnerships as we are discussing here. Uh, it views in a broader way uh, the value of resources that are not only financial, but technical, human, the knowledge, not only internally with civil society, universities, private sector, but externally too, with this all these flows that we are seeing here, north-south, south-north, north-north, south-south, and triangular, so south-north-south, or north-south-south, south, right? So it presents to us um, a, a great uh, possibility of doing in a new way, uh, achieving this new development too. And this is important too. The traditional way, the North-South based on aid to the development or social inclusion is now with the sustainable development, this brings another, uh, puts everyone in the same level somehow of need, right? So the world will be saved or maintained by everyone together. And this, um, we talk, a lot about this on the, our resilience uh, module, uh, but the, at the SDGs also bring this new understanding of the value of technical partnerships, and uh, also this new po posture of the the south uh, co south cooperation with north or or with south. Uh, so the module it, it it gives us the example of Merco Ciudades, which is a organization of South America that you know, uh, part of UCLG, one of the organizations of Latin America. Uh, there is basically an organization of uh, decentralized cooperation that uh, as Najad was proposing here, they also organize themselves uh, with a lot of technical units, they call uh, more than 20 to discuss with uh, technicians and, and local staffers, uh, secretaries on education, urban planning, local economic development. And they gather once a year to choose one coordinator and one specific uh, topic aspect of the policy to discuss uh, deep, uh, deeper deep that uh, particular year. So from this, they form uh, this uh, program of South-South cooperation that they are offering capacity building for uh, the designing of projects with emphasis in gender and SDGs. But this is interesting too, because this generates other kind of uh, partnerships, bilateral partnerships. When you bring the technicians together, they start to to exchange experiences and maybe sometimes not, not only uh, uh, in, uh, exchanges, but also uh, a specific projects without any financial resource uh, and according to what each one have. So uh, I believe this, this gives us new, new kinds of possibilities. And, and here we have like a very concrete example with uh, Mozambique uh, of this process. They, they build our, uh, all throughout these years the uh, a cooperation uh, culture on the association, 
the National Association, and they they will show us here different examples of uh, triangular north south uh, south south north uh, south and uh, south south cooperation. So I give the 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 floor to Pedro to to give us uh, their experience. Thank you very much, Pedro. You have the floor. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Fernando. Thank you, everyone. Uh, as we um, had the meeting yesterday, we will divide this presentation in two. First, me, then Abel Manik. Then I will start with the north-south, then Abel, uh, the uh, triangular, and the south-south. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, this experience of uh, cooperation uh, with all the uh, more partners in Nanam has begun in uh, early stages, let's say, of the uh, creation of Nanam in 2004, 2006. And the first experience, one of the first experience was the Canadian uh, Federation of the Municipalities. The Canadian Federation was one of the first organizations that helped build Sanam in terms of these capacity buildings, in terms of these, in terms of these visions. So this, they, that was uh, one of the first experience with the North and South cooperations. But in recent years, we had uh, uh, other other partnerships that uh, are running uh, at this moment they are running and we link this partnership with the SDGs we are talking about uh, uh, the Fondo Galego from Spain and uh, Cites Unis from, from France uh, those uh, uh, associations or so local government association from Spain and from France uh, we are dealing with them we are cooperating in different areas well, the first one, Fondo Galego in SDG 6, about water and sanitation, and the, and the Cités de France in uh, resilience. Uh, it's important to note that the second, um, uh, the, 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 with the Cités de France, it began with a particular moment uh, when the Cyclone Idai hit at Mozambique. We appeal, particularly to use UCLG, uh, that linked us to Cités Unis France. Then we began a cooperation, a technical cooperation, then a financial cooperation to establish, uh, let's say, a, a resilience community in Dondo municipality. So we are exchanging uh, a knowledge. We are exchanging knowledge in matter of resilience. And they are funding us a uh, construction of resilient houses, uh, models of resilient houses in, in this municipality of Don, which by it was heated by the cyclone die in 2019. And uh, Fondo Galego, uh, also in a Spanish uh, organization, began with the capacity building. We were sharing experience on the elected women, how they are dealing in which country. So we we change some experience and lessons, but we realized that we could be, do more than uh, just the capacity building on the municipalities and and uh, our own organization. That's why in 2019 we began another stage of cooperation that included the achievement of the SDGs. So that's why we agreed to uh, to do an assessment. In one of the municipalities, the auto also by Cyclone Dai, to see what was the main issue there. Uh, and uh, we realized that water and sanitation was the main issue that the, that municipality was facing. So together we uh, we designed this project to support uh, to support uh, the, the municipality and supply water. It's today more than 5,000 inhabitants uh, uh, will have uh, water, clean water, let's say. So it's important to say, to note that the UCLG uh, was the main actor that uh, 
was uh, that connected us to these international partners, either uh, Cités Unies France or, or, or other uh, cities, other partners in the north that now we are partners, let's say, that, our, that they, they are our partners now. So uh, talking about the north-south uh, decentralized cooperation, this is one of the uh, experience that um, I would like to share. Then uh, the other part of this, the component of decentralization, south, south and triangular, my colleague Gabel can proceed. Just to not uh, go beyond five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro, for giving me the floor. And the, as the, you said, that we focus on the south, south decentralized cooperation. And we have a good example here of a partnership between uh, a Mozambican city and the Brazilian city, which Close is, which is uh, Matola and Kanoes. And this partnership took place within a big project that was funded by EU. And again, UCLG was the institution that they mobilized the funds from EU and partnered with the ANAM from Mozambique, which is the local government association, and from Brazil, Fête Nationale de Prefeitos, which is in English, uh, uh, a network of mayors there in Brazil. So the objective of, of, of the project had, had to do with the improvement of institutional capacities of local authorities and the local authorities networks in Brazil and Mozambique as actors in this decentralized cooperation. And we have the five uh, uh, Brazilian cities in this project and the eight Mozambican cities. And the first activities that, that we undertook, it was an, a needs assessment in Mozambican cities in order to identify their priorities in the areas of municipal management. And at the end of this exercise, we, we identified three key issues, which namely participatory budgeting, cadastro, and the urban planning. So these are the three areas that were chosen uh, as the main areas of cooperation between Mozambican cities and Brazilian cities. And the Matola and Canoas agreed that they could cooperate in the matter of participatory budgeting. So during this partnership, many activities took place, such as exchange visits, both in Mozambique and Brazil. There were some trainings that were delivered by the Brazilian uh, partners in terms of uh, uh, participatory budgeting, democratic governance, and the, also the municipal, both the municipal managers and the technicians, they benefit from this training that it was delivered by the Brazilian uh, partners. So as the results of the project, these municipal managers and the technicians, they got knowledge of the participatory budget in terms of the methodology to implement this practice. And the Matola institutionalized this practice in, 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 in its uh, municipalities so that they set up, the, they established the uh, PB unity in the administrative structure of the city council, which is a, a unit that is responsible for the coordination of PB and the implementation of projects that are related to PB. And the Matola also launched the, the first edition of PB in 2016. And during this event, the, the municipal managers gathered the community decisions where they chose the uh, let's say the, the, where they selected the uh, priorities and the projects that could be implemented in order to meet the needs of the citizens. And also this uh, project helped to strengthen the democratic governance in Matola. And another good part that Matola learned from Canoas was what's called Presidencia Sem Paredes, which in English, in English could be translated as presidents without walls, which consists of gathering of the municipal managers and the citizens in an open space out of the office where the citizens, they uh, talk about their needs, explain their needs, their concerns, their questions about the different issues that are related to, to municipal management. And it is in, during these meetings, the mayor, the councillors, they give answers to those questions. So these are good practices that the Matola learned from Canoas. So just to finish, regarding the lessons learned uh, uh, from this project that was really very interesting for the Mozambican cities, we, re we realized that the political will is crucial for the sustainability of projects. 
For example, in Dondo, Dondo used to, to be known as a champion in terms of PB in Mozambique. But when the leadership changed, unfortunately, this, uh, they stopped to implement this practice because there was no political will in the new mayor. But in Matola, it was different. The political will of the mayor of Matola, which is still the president of Anam, it, uh, allowed that the PB uh, be implemented till now. And also the South-South decentralized cooperation is a uh, contribute for the sharing of knowledge, as uh, Fernando said during this presentation. This is uh, a platform for the sharing of knowledge experience. And also the involvement of other actors, such as academia, civil society, is essential for the transfer of knowledge. Just say that it, these are some examples from Mo uh, Mozambique that shows that uh, the South South Distress Foundation is a very important platform for sharing of knowledge and experience between the citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abel. Thank you very much, Pedro. I think it's, uh, it's very, very inspiring to see your experience and the experience of Anna. And as Sara has commented on, on the chat, I believe this, uh, this was the result and still uh, is a thing it's a case that is multiplying uh, different different possibilities, uh, but it's a process. It's a res result of a process, right? And here, as Sarah commented, it is fundamental. And as we are uh, discussing with uh, also with the African Association, it's fundamental the networking here and uh, the the role of the local government associations and and the networks to facilitate and to and to be this space of gathering of um, of, of local uh, public officers responsible for decentralized cooperation, uh, but not 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 only them, but also the technicians responsible for each area that could uh, uh, also meet another uh, partner, another peer that could um, cooperate. Uh, I think I will open a little bit for another observation. I see that Oscar. Uh, has the has the hand so uh, please Oscar you begin and then we we open I don't know if Sara wants to comment more too but um, it will be interesting to hear you Oscar you have the you have the floor thank you very much uh, actually uh, I, I would like to first comment the presentations uh, uh, regarding this uh, uh, typology for cooperation or local uh, decentralized, decentralized cooperation. Uh, mine was just to, uh, actually based on your question, uh, just to highlight some of the actions or initiatives even uh, that we are experiencing in our site here in Rwanda and on the region uh, regarding this collaboration. Uh, pointing that actually uh, for my uh, organization, which is the Rwanda Association of Local Government uh, Authorities, uh, one of the mandate actually beside the representation, uh, advocacy and the capacity building of the members of local governments of Rwanda is also the promotion of this uh, collaboration or partnership or what we call local diplomacy. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, collaboration between uh, 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 local governments, not only within Rwanda, but also mm -hmm. from Rwanda uh, to uh, uh, outside uh, uh, local authorities elsewhere. So uh, uh, under this process, beside activities that are organized actually to facilitate some training uh, partnership between uh, uh, districts of Rwanda themselves, so for instance, district from one uh, uh, province to uh, others from other districts, and the province basis based on some of the expressed needs on, on exchange for, for peer learning. Uh, it is also actually whenever possible when there are some uh, opportunity that are explored where local government of Rwanda can uh, learn from outside or when uh, our region uh, association of local government express the need to come to learn also from Rwandan experience, especially as regard decentralization process and local government governance. Uh, this uh, Raga or occasionally or, or facilitated this uh, process and uh, or uh, for instance in Rwanda we have different uh, practice that generally we call a homegrown solution to some of the challenges that are being experienced by local communities or 
in the development uh, process. So sometimes we uh, receive delegation from uh, association from the regions, like uh, in the East African region, and, and also occasionally Larga also facilitates some members of the, uh, the local government in Rwanda to conduct some visits uh, outside. And uh, most particularly, as we said about you mentioned the uh, element of uh, some agencies that also facilitate under uh, the collaboration and partnership of some uh, Larga stakeholders like uh, USLJ or some other partners like uh, the Adam One that was mentioned yesterday. We have, yeah, we have a collaboration with the VNG International, which is the uh, a cooperation agency of the, uh, the Dutch Municipalities Association. We occasionally facilitated uh, and, and, uh, actually some district of Rwanda, like a district called Rubav, to engage in partnership with one district, uh, one municipality of, uh, uh, of the, in the Netherlands, which is called Reden, where they could engage in a collaboration to promote uh, ecotourism uh, with the exchange, technical exchange. It's colleague to colleague partnership, where actually through this partnership, there are some uh, projects to develop a master plan for some uh, intellectual uh, tourism side, tourist site. So it's one example. And also we have many others example of this collaboration and partnership. Uh, like for the one I mentioned about Reden, which is a Netherlands municipality in Ruwa, who engaged also another municipality of South Africa, which is called Langeberg municipality, is one also uh, municipality involved in the, if we, I don't know if we can call it also triangular collaboration, but it engaged at the same time with Rwandan municipality, uh, Netherlands municipality, and also another African municipality. Uh, uh, um, maybe I, I, we, I can also mention that there are other other, other initiatives in the same uh, in the same line. But uh, for this moment, I can just mention that one. But uh, like for instance, our colleague uh, Sora who mentioned the uh, the uh, German municipality or also who are very engaged in this process of collaboration. Even in Rwanda, we have a great partnership between. German municipality uh, and uh, some Rwandan uh, district, especially the, the uh, Lenland Palatinate uh, uh, area, which has a good uh, partnership with a number of districts of Rwanda. And under RARGA for facilitation, there is an agreement to, to actually to facilitate this process of exchange, which is mainly on technical aspect, but also uh, on uh, uh, touches other aspects. Thank you. That's what I can mention about this. Thank, as thank you very experience. much, Oscar. Thank you very much. Well, I believe for the next training, you have to present your experience because you already done here a lot of different insights and um, we count on you <laughs> to present on the next uh, training. Very interesting um, uh, inputs there. I don't know, Sara, if you want to comment too. Okay, yes, with pleasure. No, very interesting indeed. Um, I just made that comment in the chat uh, because I think we have to keep in mind um, when you look back, um, the impact of the direct cooperation is of course uh, large and it's not necessarily only between one or another. No, I think the, the key is to, to um, together as much partners as possible you have a key idea, key partners like Matola and, and Porto Alegre, uh, no, uh, Canoa, sorry. But then around this, there are networks, there are more cities, actually investing in connection, in communicating and in networking pays back uh, for, for the cities. And I think that's very important. Some cities even do their own agencies and then they have an agency uh, only promote the city's experience or if or the example of Mile uh, Genevieve mentioned already, then you have a, a key um, focal point that can look at all these relations that are important and also uh, keep the institutional memory. And so the, that, that part, if you have a project and we will come to this later, when we design a project, 
often we do not allocate funding for networking and in particular we do not have persons that later do the networking because they only report to the donor to the to here to there they prepare activities but actually the networking also in the association is an activity that requires a lot of time so just to keep um, this in mind uh, is uh, maybe a lessons learned thank you so much Thank you, Sara. Yeah, the the um, the reality is is much more uh, messy than the the charts that we try to organize, right? Sometimes, as the same the same case is triangular, a, a little bit south south, depending on the 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 period of the the evolution of the the cooperation and the the historic co process of the the building of this culture, right? And um, I think we are in this process, and the SDGs are a result of this um, process as we we have seen yesterday and today so i give uh, i think uh, we are done here in time and i don't know if anyone could uh, have another observation or we can close and pass the word to i don't know if abel pedro want to comment or something we have one, one minute yet no, from my side, just to thank Sarah for having added that information. And uh, for the sake of time, we, we couldn't uh, tell er, 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 everything in five minutes, but the uh, show, as I said, uh, we also involved, there also are the institutions that were involved, such as academia, some society, NGOs, and other cities, even in Africa, for example, Deben was involved in this project actively. Yes, so just to say that it is when, when it's when we are talking about the startup. Cooperation is not all about the two key partners, but there are also other institutions that are important for the, for this to happen. Yeah. Thank you. No, no, thank you so much for acknowledging all the work, um, Abel. And I think, as Fernando said, no, the associations have to do everything on every level. So <laughs> actually, you are the key, totally. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. And 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 I forgot just to mention that too, because as the governments they change, the associations they keep the, the work being and the process and the culture being uh, cultivated too, right? So this is important. So I thank you very much uh, for the contributions for the case of Anam. And Charles, you have the floor, and then we will have Julia, I think. Charles, with you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Fernando. This is a very interesting discussion. And as we, we move on to explore practice, we are beginning to listen to practical experiences of uh, decentralized cooperation and uh, their impact on the SDGs as well. Just want to, just to, to crown this by uh, saying that, um, you know, some of you may know that the UCLG Africa has a, a peer peer review uh, program, and in every almost every peer review that we carried out, the the other institutions at the local level were all expressing the desire to cooperate with their local governments. Universities were 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 saying that we are ready to assist you. We are ready to work with you in your partnerships. NGOs were expressing exactly the same uh, um, sentiments. So there is a large pool of uh, network support that is available at the local level, which is willing to work with the local governments um, in their decentralized cooperation initiatives. We now move on to the next segment of um, our session today. And we are now moving on to looking at the methodologies and ways to engage in decentralized cooperation to promote the SDGs, the, the, the core of this, uh, of this program. So I will ask uh, Julia to, to develop, uh, to, do, to render the introductory lecture to explain this concept. Julia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Charles. So good morning, everyone. Um, and great to see you all again today. So for the past two days, we've been discussing and thinking about the importance of DC and its special role in helping us to achieve the SDGs. Um, but in practice, it can feel quite overwhelming. So the point of this lecture is to start to think about how, some of the ways to start um, and, and to break it down a little bit more. 
So there are many methodologies which can be effective um, in strengthening both operational and institutional capacities of allergies. Um, but in this module, we are looking at five kind of overarching interventions or categories. So the first is aid funding, which is something we've definitely mentioned over the last two days. Um, and this involves financial transfers, um, often from places like Europe, many um, local and regional governments and their associations will have budgets for investing in international cooperation and solidarity projects. Financial cooperation can be implied in many ways, but it's generally us talking about um, governments acting as donors, sometimes um, not necessarily having that much involvement in the projects, um, but it can take the form of basic funding basic needs for communities or education programs sometimes or feeding schemes or possibly humanitarian emergencies. Um, so the, the cities of Aachen and Cape Town have a 20 year old uh, Agenda 21 partnership and it has a number of different streams and one of them is funding conservation of Cape Town's penguin colony. So that's a, a more of an aid relation. The second um, type of cooperation that we're thinking about is technical cooperation. Um, and it's seen as one of the main mechanisms for exchange among local and regional governments. The main objective of this type of cooperation is to build local capacity, strengthen institutions, and to improve the internal organization, as well as the overall quality of service provision to citizens. Um, and the main targets of technical cooperation technical cooperation are the specific departments or officials that would receive the technical support and are involved in exchanges to improve their skills. This form of collaboration often comes about when there's a shared interest in solving a particular kind of technical problem or um, learning about a particular kind of technology that might be um, used in a different place that has been successfully implemented there. Um, and it can really be used to enhance the local capacity regarding localization of the SDGs. Um, and some examples could include building the capacity to integrate SDGs into budgets, territorial planning, um, supporting, um, like analyzing and mapping of SDG interlinkages and policies or monitoring SDG data. So whilst the nature of cooperation differs in each context and depends on the local situation, um, as well as the sectors and the actors that are involved, it is really essential that the framework of interaction is very well defined and allows for the sharing of needs, challenges, interests, and solutions. So two examples we've mentioned here on the slide are um, of technical cooperation, are of the National Association of Local Authorities of Ghana, who've been working in partnership with the Ghana Civil Society Platform on Sustainable Development Goals, as well as the Commonwealth Local Government Forum. And this is a program to help to align development plans to local economic development alongside a number of SDG targets. And it includes interventions like the Metropolitan Assembly Metro-wide LED strategy, um, which in particular targets vulnerable groups and women. And the second example we mentioned here is the Rwandese Association of Local Government Authorities. Um, and it has encouraged its members to align different local development strategies with SDG targets and has assessed the level of integration of SDG indicators. And it's been um, through training programs um, in three pilot districts, um, which would then hopefully be rolled out to further districts. Um, and has resulted in the development of an SDG assessment tool to monitor the implementation. So then we move on to the third, which is platforms for the exchange of experiences and knowledge. So this is another important mechanism, um, which is provided by international platforms. Um, that promote exchange of both experiences and knowledge between different local and regional governments around the world. It can help to facilitate the localization again of global agendas, um, particularly by focusing on thematic areas and gathering knowledge about the SDGs. 
So several networks and agencies have invested in the documentation of good practices. Um, and they also provide good contact points if people are interested in pursuing um, particular practices, knowing uh, who to connect with. Um, and in the COVID area and just generally the increasing digitalization, um, we see more digital enrollment and self-learning platforms as well. Um, and, and they're increasingly becoming popular, yeah, especially in the context of COVID. So there are two types of platforms. The first is um, knowledge platforms, and these are often established and promoted by large multilateral organizations. So an example is the European Development Days, as well as the UN's Local 2030, 2030 Initiative. The second type of platform are those that emerge and are organized by local and regional governments. So, um, and for example, the UCLG is um, really passionate about identifying, awarding and documenting practices like this where they um, can align with the SDGs. So one example is the Urban Sustainability Exchange, or also known as the USE platform um, from Berlin and Metropolis the organization. Another example, which we've mentioned on the slides, you can see is the Gangzhou International Award which was launched in 2012 in order to boost decentralized cooperation, particularly around urban innovation. Um, and it's really become a cornerstone for local and regional governments um, because it, it really celebrates and, and sheds light on how um, local and regional governments are key actors in promoting more just innovative cities that can promote the SDGs. Um, and it really also serves as a platform for sharing and exchanging innovative practices between different um, governments. So the fourth um, type is learning and benchmarking. So here um, it's really aimed at strengthening the capacities of local and regional governments. Um, it's intended to provide local and regional governments and their associations, as well as managers and staff with a, a range of updated and relevant learning and um, knowledge and strategies. These usually focus on developing relevant skills um, and generally target general management competencies that are relevant, um, like leadership skills, motivation, delegation and problem solving. The methodologies allow both individual and group learning and also encourage participants to reflect on their day to day practices. Um, and the form of peer learning, so um, learning from peers, peer to peer, really gives opportunities um, for different actors to reflect their experiences and 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 learn from each other um, in order to strengthen their relations, both um, for networking and also for further uh, solidarity, friendship, and, and bilateral cooperation. Learning and benchmarking also improves the technical capacity around SDG planning and budgeting and implementation. It can also um, focus on specific sectoral issues such as the climate crisis, uh, creating more accessible cities, or gender equality, for instance. Um, so the ODP, or the Observatory of Decentralized Cooperation, is one example of this form of cooperation. Um, so it was developed by the government of Barcelona in collaboration with the city of Montevideo. Um, and, and you can see this on the slide. Um, and it has it, it seeks to um, systematize and, and collect and share knowledge and practices. Um, and it's really fostered the role of decentralized cooperation as a key instrument of public policy. Um, so the ODC has also worked actively on the localization of the 2030 agenda um, by promoting and exchanging experiences and knowledge. Um, and it's also helped to develop a framework of analysis, dialogue and exchange. So the fifth um, form is policy development for cooperation. 
So if a, a local or regional government is interested in advancing in an international cooperation strategy, it's really useful to frame schedule and finance activities through a specific cooperation policy that includes the development of networking or project proposals. So this can help local and regional government, um, governments to advance towards greater dialogue with um, other government departments and to ensure there's transversality um, and also guarantees more uh, intersector and territorial coordination, which is really critical. The policies that can promote decentralized cooperation can be included as part of a, a, a much broader and more compre comprehensive and integrated strategy to internationalize the actions of local and regional governments. Um, so one action could be setting up an international relations office or a specific department that um, can work on political engagement, skills development, um, inter-municipal cooperation, and also service provision, um, which can also help to structure DC strategies um, in a much more holistic and, and overall integrated way. So that was really just uh, quite a brief overview of five different forms um, of cooperation that we've been focusing on and, and that kind of summarize broadly um, how decentralized cooperation plays out. Um, so to, just to summarize, um, it's aid funding, technical cooperation, platforms for the exchange of experiences and knowledge, learning and benchmarking and policy development for cooperation. Um, so just to reflect as well, if DC is to meaningfully succeed, local and regional um, governments really need to put their capacities and systems in place to ensure there's um, effective communication and participation and transparency so that all main actors can um, work together. Um, and, and these different forms can support in building shared understanding and solidarity, which are really key to achieving the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much for this uh, con concise uh, presentation. I think uh, you are also expecting some questions and uh, uh, asking the participants to raise any issues that you may wish to, to, to clarify or to explain. The, the floor is open. Yes. So um, as Charles says, um, we're now also gonna have another Q&A so if there are any questions I saw in the chat, um, Thierry raised that AfriCities is also a platform um, for exchange of experiences and knowledge. So if others want to share um, other examples or um, I see Abel has raised his hand. Go ahead. Yes, mine is not a question. I, I thank you for the presentation. I'd just like to comment on the second the typology of uh, DC. I see that the Rwanda is mentioned there. I'd like, I'd like to acknowledge that. That and the Anam from Mozambique is one of the organizations that lent from the Rwandese uh, local government as associations. And because in 2016, when we decided to restructure our seg seg secretariat in, in order to have well organized and defined uh, man, 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 man management tools of the association, we first uh invited the saga to learn us how they work how they organize what are the services they implemented the membership piece and the during the meeting during the learning learn, learn meeting that we had here in mozambique uh, saga recommend us also to contact Ralga because they are in in africa they are one of the they are strong uh, local government associations so and then we scheduled a, a visit there i started visit we went there and we learned a lot from Ralga about the membership fees, how to define the methodology of membership fees that is dynamic, and also the organization chat, how to have a very well organized organization chat that responds to the needs of the, our members, and also the membership service. Just to acknowledge that Ralga is a very good example in Africa that the other associations also can learn from, and I'm aware that other associations also have learned from Ralga. It was just to acknowledge that. Thank you. Thanks, Abel. That's a really um, useful example of um, solidarity 
Um, and also just a reminder as well that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We have all these partners in different countries that have um, lots of experience that for all the different things that um, we need to do as local and regional governments. Um, so we're definitely not alone. Um, does anyone else want to add or have a question? Um, I'll check in the chat to see if we have any other examples. Um, if you're not thinking of questions now, but you'd like to maybe reflect on something later, you're welcome to also post in the chat later. Um, and also just a reminder that we will have another um, training challenges session later, like the one that we had with um, Sorgan yesterday. Um, so if there are things that come up in the next few hours or next few days as well, that um, you're not so sure about in terms of the, the sort of more training technical side of um, the, the training, um, please let us know in the chat and we will take those up later and also um, have an opportunity to, to discuss any of those concerns. Thank you so much, uh, Julia. Thank you so much. You are right on the dot, right on the dot. Uh, so we are very much uh, exactly on time. Now, I think uh, we, we need to take a little bit of a break, a short, uh, a short break just to relax. Uh, if you are like me, you need uh, a bit of coffee to keep on pushing you. So perhaps we'll have uh, just a very short break of um, uh, 10 minutes, maximum 10 minutes. And uh, we, we come back to, to, to continue. And uh, when we come back, we will be looking more into the experiences, the practical experiences that uh, we, the, our, our partners would like to share on decentralized cooperation. So we can take a break now for 10 minutes. Thank you.
Okay, I think we should uh, get ready to start now. Um, welcome back, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I hope uh, we are all back and uh, again connected. I can see that we are, most of us are still here. So we should uh, continue now. And um, this session, this session is going to look at uh, practical experiences, a number of practical experiences. And to lead us in the process, Maria, Maria will lead us in that uh, process. Maria, over to you. Hello. Yes, sorry. I got my, I got muted. Uh, so, so now we are entering, as, as you said, in this part of the, of the exercise that we are going to be, that we are going to be actually applying these typologies and everything that we, that we learn in those wonderful lectures that were given by, by our team and, and, and our partners. We're going to be applying them in one specific exercise. So, so just just to to let you know uh, the the whole dynamic of the of the of the exercise that we're going to be divided in three specific groups, and in each of the groups we are going to be presenting one uh, experience, uh, and for the participants, I mean for the the presenters will be doing that uh, short presentation on the experiences, telling you everything that they that they want to share. Then the participants will have the opportunity to ask back any questions that they have. And then we'll, we'll, we have a small chart for participants to, to, to identify which typology we are talking about, which, um, which methodology was used, what is the flow, and if in some cases, if you can also link it with the SDGs. That will be that will be good. So so for this we have, as I said, three experiences. We have the Blantyre and Norfolk experience that is going to be presented by Major Will Nipo. Then we'll have um, a presentation of the local municipalities in Lake Victoria region that is going to be presented by Mercy Sebula and Alex Kipumbi. Uh, later on we have the experience in Group Three of Rabat and the car presented by Dr. Hajat Sami. So for this, uh, we will go to the groups, but I will, I will uh, really uh, um, call you to do the questions, to, to try to interact as much as you can, to put your cameras on so you can see each other. And, and I hope you enjoy the, I hope you enjoy the exercise. You can all go to the groups.
Hmm. Mm. Hmm. <laughs>
Hi everyone, welcome back to the, the plenary room. We're just going to wait for all the groups to rejoin and then we'll share um, what each group discussed in plenary. Hello, everybody. We're back. <laughs> Hello. <It's early. laughs> we had a small Federico and myself had a small problem here in, with the internet in the office. So, so we, we were cut off. So we weren't able to hear the, the presentation, no, hear part of the presentations, but not, not, not were able to hear the dynamics in the, in the, um, in the exercise. So, but I saw in my group that I arrived at the end that everything was set. So, so I don't know if if group one, we can we can I think we're all here. I don't know who is presenting in group one because we wanted to see the experience. So, so who is who was selected to present the exercise in group one? Maureen. Maureen. Okay. Julia, that's our group. That's yeah. our group. <laughs> okay, great. Marie. Great, Julia. So, so. So, go ahead, Maureen. Yes. Um, our, our, the presentation was from Blantyre and it was on, on, on the Blantyre North Folk Cultural Exchange and Education. And we deliberated on the type of cooperation that they have, uh, which we have identified. It's a direct cooperation on development, education, and awareness raising. And the modality that was used has been the scholarship of the North-South. So in the case of Blantyre and Northfold, both have exchanges of where students come over to Blantyre and the Blantyre students are over go going over to uh, 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 Northfold. Um, we looked at the interventions and tools and we said there is a link 
between the, the local the local government is the link. Uh, um, uh, uh, however, the partnership is between schools, the two universities, I think, and then the cultural and education exchanges. On on the flow, as it, I stated earlier, it's the north south flow because um, we were trying to figure out how much of a budget is even available with Blantyre, but the explanation provided there was that there is kind of an in-kind whereby the students are taken in by families, uh, uh, the visa processes that are being supported by, 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 by uh, the central government and so forth. And then we looked at the relevance to the SDGs and we said SDG 4 is, is, is linked to it because it's education. Oh, there's one part under interventions that is not clear on my screen. And that was the amplification of amplifying the cooperation towards other areas. And other areas meaning that uh, issues of urbanization, agriculture, that, that they will be, be looking into. Um, on, 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 on the relevance of the SDGs, we looked at agriculture because uh, they are looking into, because both of them has the same char characters almost of, 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 of the cities. And then we said SDG 9 and we said SDG 16. That is our presentation on Blandaya and Northfolk. Thank you so much. So if, if any of the group members have any input, they are welcome. Okay, anybody else wants to do some comment? Maureen, thank you for a very good presentation. And I saw that your, your team was very well led and that you were all cooperating and, and got a good outcome out of it. Anybody else has a comment? All, all well? -o? You wanna comment something on this? I wanted to say that uh, Maureen, you've done so well, and, uh, and it is good that this cooperation is bringing the climate change. Well, they were saying that how do they control the carbon emissions that are coming? And I know now that they will plant trees within the urban areas and the city. Actually, it is good. That's what Maureen forgot, and that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Okay, this is great. Okay, Sarah, Sarah wants to come on something, so please go ahead. No, just to, <clears throat> to say, I think it was very, very interesting how the municipality and in particular also the mayor engaged. So a very special thanks to these practices and <clears throat> congratulations, mayor. Yeah, thank you, Sarda, and thank you, mayor, for, for getting involved in this. This is something that that we that that we really appreciate having your time and your experience shared with us. So now for the second group who will be who will be sharing with us the outcomes of the exercise for the group on Lake Victoria. I think we didn't get to appoint anyone specifically, so I will go ahead and ask Gabel if he can share our experience. Abel, you're ready? Oh, okay. Is it me? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, we had the opportunity to hear about the experience of uh, Lake in Vitoria that uh, has to do with the, uh, pro, that's to do with the pro, uh, provision of the sanitation service in in schools. And in terms of the type of uh, cooperation, we agree that it is direct, direct and the territorial. And also regarding modality, we understood that it is about the network because there was a lot of exchange between the two cities, namely Tebi and Jinga. I, I, I hope I pronounced well the names of the cities. And regarding the integration tools, we realized a lot of the community involvement, also peer-to-peer -peer learning, 
benchmarking. And the benchmark, it was very emphasized during the presentation because the idea was to learn from the good practice and experience of the other cities in order to avoid the duplication. The idea, is, the idea here it was to avoid reinventing the wheel. This was very emphasized during the presentation. We also have the WhatsApp forum because there was a WhatsApp group that was created that was created to facilitate the exchange or change of exchange of challenges as well as of uh, the good practices and a, a good experiences. Also, digital platforms, social media, and they also took advantage of the existing resources that were available at the local <coughs> local level. So, regarding the flows, we saw that it was tri uh, triangular, south south. No subs. So as you can see, we could realize that in one in one experience, in one project, so different types of flows can take place. The same happened to the SDGs. We saw that the project was linked to a lot of different SDGs, like SDG one, SDG four, and SDG six, uh, three, eleven, fifteen, seventeen, and five. That has to do with gender equality. I'm not sure if there's other information in the screen or I've finished. Valera? Thank you, Abel. Is there anybody else okay. that would like to, to share something on, on this case? But my... You're, you're muted, I cannot hear you. Yes, if, if, if you allow me, I just want to say that we also found interesting uh, like yesterday during the exercise, that in one intervention, we could realize that there are many SDGs that are linked. So we could realize this. So this is amazing. So this is good for the local governments because they might think that they are not achieving SDG X or Z. But we could see that in one action, one project, we can link different SDGs. So this, uh, for me, it, it is amazing and it's good to know that we may be achieving different SDGs even without having that in mind. Yeah, that was good to realize. Thank you. That is great, Abel, and that is actually one of the of the objectives of this training of trainers and how to, to uh, as we were seeing yesterday, how to link this SDG with DDC. And sometimes we don't think we are linking it, but it's just a matter of where you put your head at, and if you analyze it with this lens of the SDGs, then the decentralized cooperation could be more impactful. And it is a, it is a good way to do that. Just uh, two comments on this case for the part that I, that I was able to hear. The first one is the power of uh, uh, associations and how the associations are a very good platform to, to foster and to promote decentralized cooperation. So this is, this is a very good case. And the other part that I found very interesting was the part of involving the media and how is the communication part uh, of, of a project of DC very important, even though they will have some harness in some, in some cases, but that is a case that we're gonna be seeing the importance of communication in, in our final day. So that was the, just those two comments that I wanted to mention. On this, on this presentation and thank you Abel and thank you also Mercy and Alex for sharing that with us. So for the final part, uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Dr. Ajad uh, who was presenting Dakar Rabat, but I would like to, to know if, the, if, if you have identified somebody to present the case. Yeah, thank you, Maria, for giving me the floor. I guess that was uh, Genevieve. Genevieve, that's Fernando, was great. For this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I will present, even though we hadn't decided. Um, but it's an honor for me to present. Um, I don't want to hog the floor because I'm presenting soon after this. Okay, so we had a very interesting uh, uh, group um, and uh, interesting case study also, um, which Dr. Hayat presented. Um, so it was looking at um, heritage sites, uh, sites and public open spaces and how to preserve the culture and the heritage of those, those, those um, open spaces. Um, the type of cooperation was a direct cooperation because it was between um, two studies. Uh, we went, then went on to modalities and um, 
we had a very interesting discussion before we decided on the modality. The modality that we settled on was a, a territorial partnership because it's between two cities. However, the discussion took place there as to whether um, it should be fixed only or on one type of modality or whether you can have multiple modalities have taken place. We also discussed the type of cooperation, whether you only can have direct cooperation um, or whether you can have uh, other forms of cooperation. I think just to say um, for future as trainers that um, we had a rich discussion. And I think through this discussion and through the example, we learned a lot. And you will see as we go down that we didn't actually reach the end of this exercise. But um, I think even though we didn't complete the exercise, some thought should be given when, um, to the, the manual and, 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 and the program that perhaps these type of groups can allow for that type of discussion where more learning is taking place. Um, the interventions, um, the flow was the style to style flow because it was just between um, two cities. Um, the interventions and tools um, which we came up with is what is, it was a technical cooperation uh, between the two cities. They were also looking at benchmarking. Um, there were complementary studies. A lot of learning was taking place between the two cities and there was a transfer of a lot of technical skills between the two cities. Um, when we come down to the SDGs that were, um, um, that this uh, project touched on, we didn't quite um, get to discuss those, um, but we're looking at SDG 11, SDG 17, SDG 9, and SDG 8. So that was from our group, um, unless there's anyone else would like to add on. Thank you so much, Nabir. Uh, does anyone else want to add something to this presentation? No, just, just commenting that it was very rich uh, discussion there about the, the types and modalities and how um, it's important for, for us as trainers that we are going to explain to 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 new trainers uh, the, the the types and, and possibilities of, of doing so it's important to understand the the concepts right but as the, in the same time we saw that the reality uh, is, is more complex than that and then we 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 will have to for for the designing of a project or or a policy we would have to take in to consideration what we have uh, and what would be more useful to 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 impact uh, and i believe this case was was amazing and it's a very interesting case that we should uh, uh, take into consideration on the discussion uh, for the future training issue so that's it and thank you genevieve thank you dr yeah thank you so again for the support I, I don't know, I think Maria, Maria and, 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 yes, please. And maybe just also to add um, from the group, I think to say that we did not, as I think she mentioned, Genevieve mentioned in the presentation, that we did not get to discuss the, the SDGs, but uh, I think it was, um, it was quite straightforward uh, from the flow of the discussion that uh, the listed SDG 17, 11, 9, 8, that uh, they are aligned to what we're discussing, uh, I think, in the case. But it is, it's, uh, suffice to mention that it's not exhaustive. Uh, there are other SDGs that if we had a chance and time for us to discuss, they would also have been part of the, of, of the presentation. And just also to agree with you is that uh, we had a very rich discussion we had looked at uh, a number of issues uh, that as we'll be going, I think, to make presentations uh, on this uh, will be used, I will become relevant as examples in the presentation, thanks. Yes, totally. And, and this last part that we didn't uh, do, the, the aligning, alignment or identification of, of the SDGs will be very useful too for, for later. Uh, thinking about the monitoring and the reporting 
right of each of each um, initiative that we, we are going to design there i believe this is very important too okay. uh, i'm back i'm sorry internet is not working properly in the office i'm very sorry i think you were close in the you were close in the exercise part so yes, thank you, Fernando, for covering for, for, for me. Uh, so so now I, I don't know if Charles wants to go back or if we could just go forward to the to the setting the scene for section four. Yes, uh, certainly. Um, thank you, thank you, Maria. It's been a very useful uh, session, this one, because uh, we are getting the trainers to be grounded to fully understand the mod modalities the, the flaws the terminology that is used in decentralized cooperation so with these practical experiences i found that uh, it, uh, it it uh, helps us put uh, into perspective all the terminologies that we've been uh, learning so thank you very much maria we now move on to the session four and this, in session four, we are getting into more detail, the step-by-step -step approach in decentralized cooperation in line with the SDGs. Now we are beginning to merge decentralized cooperation to the SDGs, which is the very fabric of this, uh, of this training of trainers uh, program. So in order to, to do that, Again, uh, can I call upon Mario to set the scene and uh, explain this, Mario? Thank you, Charles. So I'm just going to be very brief. So as, as Charles mentioned, this is uh, section four, which of course corresponds to chapter four of our of our module. And as you saw in different uh, in, in in the sessions before, we usually have a question for each of them of the of the chapters of the module. So this question is how to design a transformative DC in line and for with and for the SDGs. And, and, and with this, this is actually one of the, of the most wanted uh, chapters. We, every single time we do uh, the questions to, to the sections or to the partners, what do they want to do? They all, always say, let's put some emphasis in this, um, in this chapter because uh, everybody feels that they could learn more about how to do this kind of this kind of, of transformative DC in light of the SDGs. So for the bicycle analogies, just for you to see, is that we are gonna see in this section that is going to be divided in two days, we're gonna see the first part today, and we're gonna see the two other parts tomorrow and focusing on that. So for, for, for the whole idea of this, uh, the chapter is divided in, 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 three, in three parts. First part is policy, which is one of the of the wheels, uh, referring to the process of transformative um, public intervention. The other part is the project that we're going to be seeing how to design a project, uh, and is talk about the specific initiatives based on local context and needs. And the final part will be funding, uh, which is also a very uh, a very special part uh, of, of local and regional governments uh, needs that they, that, they, that, they, that they ask for. And the funding part is the energy and dynamics of development of development intervention. So, so with these three parts, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna start with a policy process. And as I was saying, tomorrow, we will be seeing project and, and funding. Uh, so with this, I go back to you, Charles, and, and, and for the latest presentation that we have. Thank you, Maria. Um, we now move on to the, the, the lecture, how to craft an effective uh, local decentralized cooperation policy linked to the SDGs. I believe that uh, Sohan is taking us through. A little video clip that our UCLG team will play on that lecture, as I understand it. Maria? Can you hear us? Are you able to hear us again? Yes, it's, 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 we're just setting up, the, it's a video lecture. So we, we're gonna be playing that video now.
In this lecture, we learn how to craft an effective policy for our local and regional governments that's linked to the SDGs. Before we do this, however, let's take a minute to remind ourselves of the importance of policy. You know, there can be no doubt that having a policy framework to guide decentralized cooperation is really a key tool for local and regional governments, and it can be a driver for SDG implementation. A DC policy can holistically define goals and visions, allocate resources, and outline the processes necessary for achieving defined objectives. Simultaneously, too, it can ensure that actions align with national SDG strategies. Co-creating an integrated DC policy also increases buy-in from important stakeholders, and it also articulates each stakeholder's role in making DC and its impacts a lasting reality. Finally, a DC policy can outline the ME frameworks in order for LRGs to measure how they're progressing in order to achieve their objectives. Okay, so let's turn our attention now to the six steps to achieve such a policy. Step one, the preamble. This introductory section does three key things. It tells the reader why LRGs are indeed international actors. It briefly reminds us of the local and the global relationships. And thirdly, it explains in a nutshell what decentralized cooperation policy is all about. Step two, the purpose. I think this is a really important section because it explains exactly why you've taken the time out to draft policy for decentralized cooperation and why it should be linked to the SDGs. Here, it's important to remind the reader of the transformative opportunity of the SDGs in the territories that we explored in Chapter 2 and the Municipal Movement Global Task Force that calls for leaving no one and leaving no place behind. In this section, it's important to outline the goals and the objectives of the policy. Step three, the problem statement. Now in this section, the background to the need for this policy must be summarized clearly, concisely, and as transparently as possible. Here, you can cover whatever you think best explains the problem. The problem can be in your territory or in the territory of the partner. The interest and the need for capacity are legitimate and the shortfall in certain aspects of service provision or the urgent need for specific groups or agendas that the cooperation could address can all be covered in this section. Whatever the content, again, it must be clear and include all important aspects related to the drafting process, the research that's conducted, the consultations involved, and any possible compliance issues. Step four, the actual policy. Now, without a doubt, this is the heart of the framework and explains all of the rules that are to be put in place. As outlined earlier, the policy entails the commitment of leadership to achieve specific and generic steps, uh, targets. Step five, procedures. It's in this section that we address exactly how to achieve the task. Here, we must outline how the stakeholders can work together for achieving SDGs. Of course, we acknowledge it's very time intensive, but ultimately it allows for integrated and people-centered work. This part of the policy outlines a set of guidelines or rules as to how to make policies effective and recognizes the engagement of technicians beyond departments and even beyond your municipality. Um, we may also want to include an outline for an implementation plan here. Finally, step six, policy evaluation and review. Now in this final section, we evaluate what we've done. Remember that the international agenda is a wonderful opportunity to show the work of cooperation as well as of the municipal services that help to achieve the SDGs. The evaluation suggests mechanisms for checking achievement and even amending the policy, as well as reporting and communicating on all the work done. This last part of the policy is important because it ensures that the policy remains relevant in an ever dynamic and ever changing socio-economic political context. Good luck 
with drafting your policy process. Great. Well, thanks, Sogan, for um, giving us that lecture. Um, I think Mary Alice's internet is still having problems. So maybe we should just hand over to Genevieve, who will be sharing um, experiences from the Durban case. Hey, um, Maria was going to share my presentation. I sent it to her. I will do that now. Just one okay, second. Thank you. As we're waiting for that presentation, just to say again that we set this whole thing up for the internet to go down in Barcelona, just to show how we're going to deal with the complexities even in northern cities. Sorry, I'm just teasing, but uh, I think Jen, it's all right. Okay, thank you. Um, can you move to my presentation, please? I sent a one slide uh, page, one slide. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so I'm looking at my watch. Good afternoon, everyone. It's the afternoon here in, in, in Durban. And I'll say Sangonani Nonke, because that's how we greet here uh, in the kingdom of the Zulu. So um, I'm honored to share the, the Durban experience with you on, on decentralization. And if you look at the first box, uh, it shows our Tigrini municipality. Durban is, is, is part of um, a Tigrini municipality. So what had happened is that every year we had to submit um, a report to the Auditor General to check uh, whether we as a municipality or municipalities in South Africa are reaching their targets. Um, and in around 2008, the Auditor General came back and was not happy with how we were performing as a municipality. And he cited one of the challenges and one of the problems that were causing us to not deliver as we should be del delivering is that we did not have um, a good package of policies in place to guide us um, regarding service delivery. And so we were instructed as a municipality to go back and to look at um, our policies or lack thereof of, of policies that we, we had. Um, and then um, a department was set up, our, our city manager then set up a department of research and policy which sits directly in, in the office of, of, of the city manager. Um, and one of the policy analysts, uh, Carolyn Kerr, who has now retired, um, was tasked with driving this year and touching base with all departments within the, in our Tigrini municipality, in the Durban municipality, to ensure that the um, policies are aligned. So <clears throat> Can you all hear me? Uh, sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Is it okay? We're fine, Jen, we're fine. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, and, and if you look at the, the, the cycle of, of, of how to develop policy, that again has just presented, um, this came out from the Durban experience and Carolyn Kerr um, then um, put this uh, together to guide all departments um, on how to develop their, their policies. Up until now, we still do not have a decentralization policy. However, our IDP, which is our integrated development plan, which is the guiding plan for our municipality, is very serious about um, decentralized cooperation. cooperation. Um, and one of our previous uh, city managers um, then took this very seriously. And that's when MILE, the Municipal Institute of Learning was set up in 2009 as a knowledge management platform to actually drive decentralized cooperation. So all our SDGs, all our programs in MAL, we align them to the SDGs. So MAL is also a platform for aligning the SDGs to whatever uh, we do. And, and, and might I add that Sugien, who's no longer with the municipality, um, was the forerunner of MAL. And uh, um, most of what we do today, again, actually um, um, developed because he was the, the senior manager of MAL 
who actually drove us and who actually helps us to disseminate this decentralized cooperation. Um, I also want to just give some hope because I know that there's many of us who don't have strong policies in place. And even though we still don't have a strong decentralized policy in place, we didn't become paralyzed due to the lack of this policy. We went out there and we did what we could do. But I can add that because we had political leadership and we had senior management and administrative leadership, we were able and we still are able to go out and to drive this decentralized cooperation, despite the fact that we do not have um, a policy in place. And, and, and uh, from that, uh, the, the, the previous presentation um, on, on, on uh, policy uh, and methodologies, one of the things that was said is that the methodology, the ways to engage decentralized cooperation is through learning and benchmarking. And that's what MILE is about. MILE is about peer learning. So it's peer-to-peer -peer learning, learning from one another through our political administrative leadership. As we went along as MAL, we learned by doing. We didn't wait and then had this whole successful plan and went out to do. We learned by doing. And after each session, we'd come back to the boardroom as MAL under the leadership demo, Denos again. And we'd say what worked well and what didn't work well. So we learned by doing. And through doing as we went along, we realized that whilst we are doing, we are these mistakes that we are making with our partners out there. And then we found the need to develop a set of policy guidelines and procedures on how to engage with our partners to make it an amicable relationship so that we are not frustrating our partners and our partners are not frustrating us uh, in stuff that we expect to be done that's not been done. And this is the, the, the just to, to give you an example of the, the, the set of guidelines and policy guidelines and procedures that every time we engage with partners, we email to, to, through to them and we say, yes, we put in up our hands. We want to work with you. We want to partner with you in an informal um, a manner, but this is our set of policy guidelines. We expect an invitation letter from whoever's asking us to come and work, to come and partner, we say, send a formal invitation letter through to, to our city manager. We also want a concept note. Why do you want us to come? What are we there for? How are you going to work together? Send us a concept note on whatever project we are going to work on. We they also ask for adequate lead time because we are very small departments as well. There's like six of us serving the whole continent. Um, and um, so we say, give us, three months lead time so that we can fit you into our schedule because often people will say, okay, can you come next week? Because we need to have our new IDP written and it's impossible for, for us to come in a week's time. Um, we also have um, pre, we also request a pre-workshop meeting, be it face-to-face -face, uh, previously prior COVID or virtual. We say, let's have a pre-workshop meeting so that we can determine your needs. We can determine your outcomes that you want for this, this, for, for this partnership. We also do not, whilst we are paid by our municipality for the work that we do, we do not burden our rate payers. Um, so we say that whoever we are partnered in with has to pay for the accommodation, for our meals, for our travel, for our stipend. And those of you who are here, where we work from the Moorings from Malawi, uh, from Namibia, from Malawi, you know this very well. We also then say to our host, to uh, the partner, logistical arrangements to the events you are responsible for logistical arrangements, how we expect the room to be set up, what materials we need, et cetera, et cetera, what support team we need. And then importantly, we say, what monitoring and evaluation are you going to have post us coming on what we come in to, 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 to support uh, you on? Because if there's no monitoring and evaluation in place, then we are wasting our time and you are wasting, and, and you also wasting your rate payers time. So for example, Costly and Bland Tire, we've worked with you. Um, initially, we'd, after three months, I'd phone um, our partners and I'd say, okay, you said you'd have this in place. Do you have this in place? So initially it would be every three months, I, we have a, 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 a virtual meeting, a telephone meeting. And thereafter it becomes every six months and once a year, I just touch base with our partners after a while to see, to check on the monitoring and evaluation. 
I know that one of uh, um, our speakers, our colleagues mentioned this morning about academic partners for decentralized cooperation and that you have your academic partners and your universities are waiting to work with you. Mao also has one of the pillars of MILES is that we collaborate with all academia. So we collaborate with all our tertiary institutions um, in South Africa and in the, 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 the rest of, of, of the world. Uh, whereby um, we have partnerships, we have MOUs uh, with academic institutions. So that in a nutshell is um, how um, we have tried to decent, uh, uh, put in our decentralized cooperation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Genevieve. That was really um, such an interesting input. Um, we're gonna hand over to Sorg and Moodley now for um, a Q&A. Thanks so much, Julia. And thanks, Jen. Uh, it was quite nostalgic um, reflecting on Mile again. Thank you so much. And I was looking at Sarah there on my video and her smiles and, and, and her point made earlier about how important it is around the partnerships and the networks and the relationships. And that's not documented enough. Um, that's really so important and that, but that's uh, really the tissue that holds it together. So I'm looking at the time and I know we are running a little bit late, So, but it's really important around uh, uh, this policy section. Um, so I've been, I was given 10 minutes, but I'm going to try and shorten it a little bit. But the, 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 the point is the policy is that front wheel of the bike. The project is the back wheel, right? And not a lot of cities, certainly on our continent, have the luxury of preparing a decentralized cooperation policy, right? So I want to do an exercise very quickly. By show of hands, if I can ask by show of hands, how many of us who are working in our respective local and regional governments can say we have a formally adopted decentralized cooperation policy? It's there in black and white. It has a clear, well, I've been through the whole, all of the stages and on purpose and procedures, and it's adopted. This is our Bible or Quran or Gita. This is what drives us. So just by show of hands, um, can uh, just raise your hand, not for a question, but just to say, yes, it's there. We've got it adopted. So, and others who are facilitating can help me look at the screen. I see one, uh, Mr. Funga. I'm just going to the, uh -huh, thank you. And I'm going to the next screen and I can't see any other hand raised. Oh my word. So this is quite a telling example. Mm, deep sigh. So it does seem this is a challenge. And when we are writing up the module, um, I think uh, as, as we are saying in intro comments, it is certainly a challenge because not just for decentralized cooperation, but for, as um, Genevieve mentioned earlier, the Auditor General in Durban said, this is a problem and you are going to Hello. be in big trouble. Hello. Hi, Hi I see someone wants to raise something. Um, no, I, I see someone is, is wanting to, to talk. Is that is that correct? No, okay. So, uh, if everyone is on board and if everyone, uh, if the indication is that it seems that in Zambia we have just one case uh, of an adopted policy, then my next question over the next two or three minutes is, why do you think there's this hesitancy for us to prepare a policy? Is it that one, it's, it's perceived to be a luxury? Is it, as we think it could be, maybe we don't have the tools. We don't know how, how, like in Durban, this was the problem. We didn't know how to construct a good policy. And that's why we spent so much of time and effort in trying to give you a step-by-step -step guide. So is, is it that? Or what do you think very quickly? And I'm looking for participation now. So if you could now raise your hand to say, so again, I think this is the issue here. Um, so we're really looking in the short two or three minutes, what do you think is the underlying challenge? Or if you want to uh, uh, type using the chat, we certainly can do that. Um, I'm looking at the, 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 the chat group. I'm, I haven't seen anyone here. I see uh, Fernando, is there, is there, are you raising your hand? Yes, please. Yes, just to, just to start the discussions and like to 
try to to think about what you what you said. Uh, in my opinion, uh, and this is not official and it is not in the module, but I believe it's a um, it's a process, a, a cultural process uh, in the the local administration. I, and I am talking about ex uh, uh, officer uh, in an administration in Brazil. I believe. Uh, uh, sometimes we are not used to um, do the cooperation as a value or do a search for solidarity or for technical expertise uh, in other in other places uh, because we don't know uh, the the how this can change uh, local public policy and once we try and we do and we change things effectively i believe this is a we open a way to 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 consider this as a useful uh, policy local policy but it's a, i think it's a cultural process and and construction uh, at least in, in, for the brazilian cities and uh, and one thing that you mentioned is also very important to try to, and Sara mentioned too, then try to document and try to measure the changes that uh, decentralized cooperation policy make. So I believe this is a, uh, an important thing for us to think too, when we talk about, when we, and we will talk in the next day about monitoring and reporting. I think this is a very useful tool also for, uh, justify and to show how important this, this practice is. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm just looking at the chat there and Oscar's raising an important point. He's saying it is raised a strategic element, but it could be sitting in the association's plan. So Realga has it, but maybe, and this is an important point that sometimes it's sitting in the associations, but it's not necessarily embedded in the actual municipalities. And, and I think that's why uh, we really have to talk about how we, when we're talking about decentralized cooperation, how do we bring it down to the municipal level? And how do we, um, as suggested on the chat right now, maybe there isn't by Terrafalo, there isn't expertise. And importantly, there's not enough dedicated capacity. And I think that for me is the million dollar issue. And it was interesting to hear Genevieve talk about capacity and having mile to actually push this because the truth be told, if we didn't, I think we, if we didn't have the institution and that capacity, um, I'm sure that, that that's really important. And I see uh, uh, and the Jat raising a hand and I'm sure she's going to be talking about this uh, issue. Uh, so maybe I can give her the floor. And I see also uh, Sarah was also writing the chat, but uh, uh, Dr. Zero. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, so sorry, I was uh, committed to another event and I'm happy to join at, the, at this appropriate uh, uh, moment. Uh, I think one of the main challenge facing uh, the implementation of uh, DC is first of all, do our members master and owner the legal framework of decentralized cooperation? Sometimes they don't know about this legal framework. So we need to aware the, these members and to owner the legal framework concerning decentralized cooperation about uh, what is allowed, what is not uh, allowed, the process, uh, who are involved, etc. The second thing, I totally agree with uh, Sujan and uh, one of the, uh, the uh, participants in the chat. Uh, we need to have at least in the NALA, in the National Association, or the, the capital cities, a staff dedicated to decentralized cooperation. Uh, skilled, uh, competent, engaged. Uh, I used to, to, uh, to uh, highlight some examples. Uh, here in the city of Rabat, I'm very happy to work and uh, engage with uh, Dr. Hayat Sami because when you will call her and you explain to her there is an opportunity of decentralized cooperation, she will be there. She will uh, try to understand how to engage, how to follow up, how not to miss this opportunity. So we, we don't see this kind of reaction all the time within our members. And I'm also, and it's final, uh, final uh, comments, I'm very happy that in our new organization, we have now 
a special advisor dedicated to decentralized cooperation. We will build on this initiative to empower our members to make sure that decentralized cooperation it is not only a matter of traveling, of shopping, but to in, invest in, in, in a, a sustainable uh, development. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just looking at the chat function and I want to summarize for everyone because I see Alex uh, wants to make a point and Sarah wants to uh, wrap up making the last point, but there's very interesting points in the chat. So if you just uh, want to pick up on that around Zimbabwe and Zambia and Bissaka, thank you so much for those comments. But because of time, I'll just hand over to Alex and then Sarah will uh, wrap up this, uh, uh, the session. Alex? Yeah, one of the reasons why we lack police, uh, policies, especially in municipalities in Uganda specifically, is that we lack confidence and belief in ourselves. We have this feeling that uh, policies are supposed to be spearheaded, uh, done by the central government or consultants, and yet we have not tried it out. So that really impedes the, 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 that really impedes municipalities, especially in Uganda, having such policies in place. I submit. Thank you. Sarah, I think you're on mute. Okay. No, thank you very much. These were excellent uh, comments. And I think um, first I would like to say that globally, there are very little examples of policy for decentralized cooperation. So what we have observed in Durban is, uh, I would say, a front runner worldwide with other cities they have done of course the same but it is still not usual that cities do this um, and also the understanding of decentralized cooperation when you look on the professional understanding of decentralized cooperation we will come to this is design project manage project monitor projects and the the treasure of uh, ownership of our politicians uh, is in the decentralization will unfold if it is politically ensured. If not, you have to, uh, with every single say, you have to inform. And as Nayat was saying, the understanding then is that, well, it's only about travel or only about protocol and an international relation office in case it is set up, because not many cities do have this. Then it is about managing travels and looking uh, around and, and less on the on that political impact uh, that can can unfold in a city when it is well answered. So I think first I would like to say that it is not the case that African cities do not have, Asians do not have. So it is still mainly five, maybe five percent uh, that have a decentralized cooperation policy. But this is a future. And uh, the point here, I think, is important because it links to the advocacy agenda of the national associations. It is not enough that national associations do only say we should care of everything that comes to the cities and then we can maybe be <clears throat> the catalyst between national uh, government and cities to, as it was done in the past and as it is still usual in Europe and the VNG and the CUF and and all the association try to make this catalytic role. This is also limited. We need to build on the strength of a city that has a political commitment because there is the power of uh, advocacy. So this political commitment we will never achieve if we don't work on the policy. So it is like a trap. And I think we have uh, here a very good example. And it is interesting, for example, in a city like Blantyre that is large, that is skilled, <clears throat> Of course, it makes sense uh, if you have a policy, then later you can connect all your departments, you can connect everything to the international work. And it's not only about relation, it is really about practices and using all the networks. And we can say that this is a, the trend when we see strong cities, for example, Chef Schauen uh, has a decentralized cooperation policy. And you can see it's a small city, it's shining world over because everybody is connected and every practice has its place. So uh, uh, the things are more ordered and it is not only one person, it is the whole city behind. 
So I think um, that part, I, I really appreciate so much that we could rely on this example of Durban because there are not many. In Latin America, we talk this, uh, uh, this stream is named the internationalization. So this is also because we need to go away from only cooperation and only looking uh, protocolitarian, but um, generally we, this is uh, something we, we have to jump on. It is, uh, 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 we have a lot of partners asking for this. And if you do this as cities and association, you will succeed. So thank you very much. Sorry for the time. <laughs> it took a lot, lit, lit, a minute too long. Thank you so much. So I'm handing back to Charles, who will uh, hand over to Julia, I think. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks very much. Uh, it's been a very interesting session, um, uh, this one. Quite uh, some very good experiences. So perhaps uh, later we'll just uh, make a, a quick summary of uh, everything. But before that, uh, Julia is supposed to come in and uh, just check in on the training challenges. Great, thanks Charles. Thanks everyone for a very interesting discussion. So like we did yesterday, we're going to share um, a little moment that um, you as participants can reflect a bit on maybe more technical challenges or reflections that you have. Um, and Nolotando has collated some of your reflections, but you're also more than welcome to share them here. Um, so just this is more of a, a comment that was reflected that I'll read. So it came from the South-South decentralized cooperation example of Matola, Brazil, um, and Canoas in Mozambique. And they say that we noted that the attraction of many partnerships was only possible because of the investment in networking, events, and knowledge involving as many stakeholders as interested. And these must be planned for and budgeted for. So um, thanks so much for that uh, key reflection. Um, are there any other questions or comments that derive from the, the first half of the day where we looked at chapter three, which was on how does DC work in practice? If not, then uh, we have a comment. Ah, right. Just a correction that Matola is in Mozambique and Canoas is in Brazil. Thanks. Um, well, we can always come back here, but otherwise I'll move on. So we also had a question of, will there be a certificate of participation after the module four training? Um, I'd just like to refer to Charles, perhaps you could answer this question. Um, yes. Uh, Yes, uh, Marielle, there, there will be a certificate of participation, but I would like to ask uh, Najat to, to confirm that. Is Najat still with us? I she can just also out for a while. We will, we will give certificates uh, jointly um, with ALGA and UCLG Learning. Perfect. Confirm, Sarah. Great. Thanks. This is, uh, this is a core value in ALGA of UCLG Africa, but there is uh, some prerequisite we will uh, talk about uh, at the end of this seminar. Okay. Thank Great. you. Thanks very much. Um, the second um, was a question from Thierry. In our group, we have seen that the type of cooperation can take many forms. This shows us the cooperation is not fixed and it evolves. So my question is for the cities and associations, how do they deal with this kind of complexity? So I think that's a really crucial question. Um, I'm gonna open it to the floor um, and see if there are any reflections. Um, if not, perhaps, um, someone from UCLG Africa or UCLG Secretariat wants to reflect on the question? I think uh, what we can, uh, well, my contribution to this is that, uh, you know, like I explained yesterday, 
decentralized cooperation has developed from, uh, from very humble beginnings. And as we all saw yesterday, it was mainly driven by the need to foster uh, solidarity and foster friendship to heal the wounds of uh, either wars or uh, colonial uh, domination. And um, over time, uh, it has progressed to now become more developmental in nature. And uh, this de development has also gone beyond the normal relations between city to city, local authority to local authority to become even more complex to have networks, networks of uh, cities uh, uh, beginning to really look into the deeper issues of development. So it has progressed over, over, over time. So, and also furthermore, it, there is more increased recognition that a partnership is not only between the institutions of local government, but also transcends beyond that to include civil society, universities, and uh, other actors in development. So this complexity is inevitable. So um, the, what, we, what we grapple with is to try and work effectively in this kind of uh, situation, which actually in a way um, responds well to the SDG principle that uh, you, we try to bring along, we should not leave anyone behind. We should all be included in the development uh, process. So the complexity is welcome in this part of the development of the dynamics of decentralized cooperation. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Charles. Ah, you should, um, you should... Sarah, do you want to add to that? Yes, um, I think um, uh, definitely this is a challenge and um, it is a pity our colleagues from Platforma are not here today. But they would be, um, maybe we can uh, uh, give them this question later on, because, for example, what we learn on the case of Blantyre, when you have education exchange or community awareness raising, these are completely different boxes in the European <laughs> Commission, no? uh, uh, for example, uh, who is a big donor. And they call it the DEAR process, so the awareness oh. raising and uh, civil society awareness raising, so they are educational. And then you have the decentralized cooperation project and they treat it like two shoes and they also see that are now that it is very important to, to deal them together. So uh, they are both located in platforma. And I think <clears throat> in a city, it is very uh, clear that everything is linked. We learned this from Blantyre, know how everything is linked and there is no, not such big difference in the typology. So I think um, what is uh, here to the, to the cities and us, so for the cities, I don't see a larger problem in the typology. Maybe more it is whom do you communicate to and, and the funder and the re invest in the relations. For the association, I think um, it is important not to forget that this edu educational aspect, awareness raising, also all the work we have done with the uh, SDG and what Jean-Pierre was telling us yesterday, that the localization is in the end this uh, way how we capture this. And this helps because as more our stakeholders know about the SDG and associations know about the SDG, is more clear uh, it is to deal with these different typologies. Uh, because I, I agree to Charles, it's inevitable that we need to look at them all together and, and come everybody out of the little box. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Over to yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I want just to uh, uh, share the example of, uh, let's say, Morocco, which is very, very inspired by the French uh, experience. Uh, when we talk about the typology of the decentralized cooperation, there is also the internal decentralized cooperation. For example, the intercommunalité, uh, when you have uh, uh, local or uh, regional uh, government working with uh, each other, but in, inside the country or with the private sector or other public institutions. 
for Morocco, based on the legal framework, it's also a type of, of uh, decentralized cooperation. And we have also what we named the city diplomacy. So uh, here it is uh, linked to the official diplomacy when uh, we ask the local and regional authorities and the collectivities to support uh, some national causes. Uh, yeah, this is also is considered as a decentralized cooperation. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Najat. Um, if there are no more responses to this, I'm going to move on to the next set of questions. So um, this is to more reflect more broadly um, on your experience as participants and trainers um, of today. So were the lectures clear? Did you um, find certain aspects of the lectures challenging or not very um, clearly defined? Um, and would you, do you feel comfortable that you would be able to replicate them? As trainers, would you now be able to take these lectures and give them yourself after going through the module a bit? Um, so that's really a question to the, the trainers. Um, and it would be really nice to, to hear maybe some of your reflections on your experience of today. Uh, we have one hand by DC Hartley. Go ahead. Okay, hi, it's Genevieve. Genevieve. Okay, um, I think that I would be able to replicate them. However, um, I think that the first time that um, I would be um, required to run this um, a similar training session, it would give me comfort if I could have um, one of um, the other trainers with me um, so that, um, you know, we can piggyback on one another instead of doing it alone. Mm. Thank Thanks, you. Genevieve. That's a really important reflection. Um, I think Josephine, you were next. Yes, um, I think just as Genevieve has said, uh, it would be easy to replicate them especially with thorough, you know, review of the slides and guides. Uh, I'm sure once I go through the slides over and over, then it will be easier for me. Wonderful, thank you. Oh, well, I'm not sure if I'm doing the correct order, but yeah. Oh, well, go well, ahead. I think I'm great, Josephine and, uh, and Genevieve. I will try to put my English name there for everyone to easily pronounce it. I think it would be easy for us to uh, uh, deliver the, the sessions, but I think it's good to have someone like if we wear trainings so that in an event where I left out something, I have someone with me there to help out. And Ulwaya, sorry, I'm butchering your name, but please go ahead. Well, yeah, Funga? Hello. Yes, were you able to hear me? Sorry, no. my internet keeps on dropping. Yes, I, I just... I just mentioned that I agree with uh, Josephine and Genevieve it would be easy to, to, to train others, but it would also be good to be with someone in that training, like for the first trainings. Okay. Um, just for quality assurance. <laughs> Great, thank you. Ali? <laughs> okay, thank you. I think the, the lectures were quite clear. Uh, and in terms of replication, yeah, that can be done. But however, I've also learned that um, from the, this session that uh, when you're training, it's important also to do like a team training whereby you be supporting each other and also whereby you'll be able to 
take from different uh, examples. But I think what is more most important, what I've also learned is that uh, examples are very important when you are giving such uh, lectures. Thank you. Great, that's also a really um, useful input. Um, maybe, do you feel like there were enough examples in the lectures? Yeah, I could say the, there were not enough examples okay. to enable us as trainers to really share and be able to be, you know, very resourceful in terms of knowledge transfer. Hmm. Okay, that's a, that's a really helpful reflection. Um, if you go through the module, you might find that there are some extra examples that could also be useful. So we also definitely encourage all the trainers to really go through the module. Um, in the module, there are also quite a lot of helpful, um, like extra hints or suggestions of um, ways to consider of how to run the exercises, both online and offline. Um, so it's definitely a really important um, point that's taken about including more exercises, um, I mean, more examples. Um, and also just a reminder to definitely go through and really use the module as, as a support and guide. Um, UCLG Learning, I'm not sure who's on that account, but you wanted to, you have a raised hand. Yeah, no, just to comment that apart from the module, the handouts and the presentation that like explain a little bit each uh, possible presentation or activity. Uh, we already um, are uh, recording all the sessions we are doing with with you of of all the days and the previous ones that we we did with uh, Europe too and with the the USG World Secretariat so that you can have like this as a reference for you too. So when you when you plan your training, your own training. You have the module, you have the presentation, and you have the video that uh, was done of another uh, session. So you can have as a reference. So this, um, uh, we, we will also indicate, with, uh, we, we will share here on the, on the chat for you, okay? Thanks, Fernanda. That's also a really good point. And maybe something I also wanna highlight that um, I'm also not an expert in DC. Um, I'm quite new to this, um, but I found in preparing for my lectures that the, the videos from the previous um, training were very, very helpful in reflecting of how have other people done it, um, what examples did they give, what examples maybe that I can draw from my own knowledge. And I think um, it's really important and I really encourage you to also see your own expertise and, and that you all have examples probably to draw from. Um, and and to, to, yeah, just also believe in yourself and have confidence in yourself that we are very confident that you're all very equipped um, to be trainers. But please also just keep asking lots of questions if you're not feeling comfortable with anything. Um, Najat. Uh, thank you. Uh, Julia, uh, to reply to this uh, answer to this question, uh, I think first of all we need to uh, uh, to keep in mind that we are investing in future trainers. So uh, it is very important that uh, our trainers will uh, will improve themselves by doing. And uh, by doing, we used to see those who will, uh, let's say they are senior trainers. They are all ready to go. Uh, I think Genevieve has uh, served as trainer in so many activities. Uh, she needs just to uh, uh, master what we have done this week and she can deliver a, a, a trainer for our, uh, our ecosystem. And we have the junior. Uh, you can uh, uh, master the, the topic of decentralized cooperation, but you need also to master the pedagogical aspects. So it's not easy to uh, teach and to train adults and not easy to teach and train local authorities and the local staff. So I think this is a first, uh, a first uh, part of our uh, journey. So we will make sure in the future to involve this first uh, uh, cohort 
uh, and I'm sure that uh, by doing, they will uh, they will become excellent and sound uh, trainers for our uh, organizations. Thank you. Thanks, Najat. Um, and it, it also highlights how um, we, all of us today, are, are forming our own network and own relationships. And I encourage you to reach out to others who are in this training and maybe, you know, ask if you want to do the presentation for them and they can, you know, as Sogan said, maybe like a buddy program. So um, just really encouraging you to also take initiative to um, within yourselves and power each other. Uh, Genevieve. Okay, um, thank you. Um, and thank you to uh, my sister Najat for that, con that, uh, that uh, confidence in me. But I, I just wanted to say that um, I think that whilst I understand that we have a lot to get through in, in, in four days and four half mornings, I think that we're trying to cover too much. And even though uh, with my experience, I, I find it overwhelming at times, it's information overload, even though I've read through the whole module. I think it's information overload. Now, more so for people who are coming in for cold. Um, mm -hmm. And even though we know that we say read through the module, not everybody's going to read through the module. So are we trying to just tick box this exercise and get through it? Or are we really trying to instill confidence in people that they can go out? And I'm not saying for, the, for this, this set of trainers. I'm just saying that it's a thought for all of us to have for in future when we train it. Are we going to keep it to four half days? Or, for, or, or are we going to extend the period? Because my sense is that those exercises that we did is really where we came to the nuts and bolts of what we are doing. But mm -hmm. we didn't have enough time in those exercises even to, to interrogate and to discuss in our groups. So that's just food for thought for all of us. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Genevieve. And I think that's also a really important input um, in terms of feeling really overloaded. Um, so maybe also I just wanted to encourage participants in the next two days to make use of this as a safe space for learning. So really volunteer when it's the opportunity to feed back to the plenaries, like that's a great opportunity to practice for when the next training comes. Um, so I'm gonna close this session now, um, unless there are any more burning questions. Let me have a quick look. No, okay, great. So we're gonna start wrapping up today. Thank you so much everyone for um, really great questions and really great inputs. Um, oh. And so yeah, so just to, to reflect today, we went through chapters three and some of chapters four. So we looked at how does DC work in practice and how can we design DC in line with the SDGs? And we'll continue with that chapter tomorrow as well as chapter five. Um, yeah, but thank you everyone for your really um, engaged, like great engagement, active engagement, and really encouraging you to really take advantage of the next two days to speak more, to engage more, to try out the mural when you have the opportunity um, to, to practice speaking. And really this is a safe space to, to practice with one another. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Charles for perhaps the closing words, if you would like to say anything, Charles. Thank you, Julia. Um, I think it has been a very key day today. Um, like uh, Julia has just been uh, explaining, just to, to very have a very quick uh, recap of uh, what we covered. Um, just to, to consolidate the, the knowledge that we gained today. Today, we were moving more into practice. We are, we are, we are, we are unpacking the decentralized cooperation. That's very key. We looked at the typolo typologies. We looked at the modalities. We introduced the, the, the flaws, the kind of relationships that we, we have in decentralized cooperation north, 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 south, 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 triangular, all those elements were covered. We also looked at very interesting uh, uh, experiences uh, from uh, Mozambique, where they explained to us the, 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 the partnerships uh, which they were having, which had uh, quite an impact on uh, SDGs, the supply of clean water and sanitation, sustainable cities and uh, communities, 
Um, we also looked at South-South cooperation between Matola and the Kanoas. Now, just to very quickly summarize some of the lessons which the Mozambican experience gave us, they highlighted that uh, the political will is crucial. It is important for the, the, that there the is political will. It is also important for other actors to be involved, like we have uh, also emphasized throughout this session today. Um, also, the benefits of knowledge sharing was uh, highlighted uh, quite a lot and the need to, to strengthen capacities. We then moved on to quickly look at uh, how to start up the decentralized cooperation and also the, the, the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, key elements that would be involved in, uh, in setting up uh, decentralized cooperation. We looked at those which are primarily focused on aid funding, others uh, technical cooperation, platforms of exchange of experiences, learning, benchmarking, policy development for cooperation. Now, I just want to emphasize here that it was not uh, intended to say that uh, any of these would be exclusively for a particular decentralized cooperation. They can be mixed. They can be included in uh, the same decentralized cooperation arrangement. All these elements can be there as well. And then we quickly also had a look at uh, the practical experiences of uh, Malawi, Blantyre, and Norfolk the Victoria region, very interesting South-South uh, cooperation uh, experiences that we will learn in, uh, in the Victoria region. We also looked at the experience of Rabat and uh, Dakar, again, uh, to consolidate our understanding of uh, decentralized cooperation. Now, finally, of course, we looked at the way to design the decentralized cooperation. And today, we started with the element of policy. Uh, we explored how to deal with the with the defining policy for decentralized cooperation. And we found that uh, not many countries actually have this uh, policy on decentralized cooperation. The experience of Deben was quite uh, unique and that uh, we need maybe to, to promote this uh, element. We also found that uh, because of sometimes because of national policies, it becomes a little bit complicated for uh, local, local government cities to develop their own decentralized cooperation policies. Sometimes it is necessary to understand the framework of the national policies and then um, use those to develop our own policies at the, at the, at the local level. So this is basically what we dealt with uh, today. Tomorrow, tomorrow we move more into the practical development, the projects. How do we build up a decentralized cooperation uh, projects? Very key. How do we mobilize for the funding of these uh, projects? Funding is a key element, whether, whether we like it or not, but it is a very key element of uh, decentralized cooperation, we'll be looking at that. And we'll also be looking at partnerships, how to build partnerships to support uh, decentralized cooperation. So basically this is what we looked at today and what we expect for, for tomorrow. Thank you very much. Uh, unless there are any other uh, words from uh, other organ or other uh, colleagues to add to this before we close the meeting today, None. So it is time to say goodbye for today. Thank you very much for participating. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Please, those who have Twitter account, please do Twitter. You know the power of communication. <laughs> yes. We appreciate if you do your own Twitter and any ideas so that the, outer, the larger community can follow us as well. Yep. Thank you so much. And please, the, the, the core team that is organizing, yes. could, could we please stay a little bit longer?
to do some some debriefing and preparation yes. for tomorrow. Thank you. Well, thanks.